Um, there. Is it stolen? Yes. All right. Great. Well, I'm going to launch into it. Uh, thanks for the intro. Here's the rest of my intro. So uh, to, not, to not get too much about me, um, uh, my, my part of my background is actually in web design and, and graphic design, which is my first major. And uh, I've worked uh, in nonprofit, uh, academia, for-profit um, government institutions. And basically in each of those roles, I've typically been a communications person or my job has been to communicate sustainability issues. Um, and then, of course, now, uh, as we said, now in this region, uh, happy to be a part of Passive House Rocky Mountains and Colorado Green Building Guild. Um, so this presentation is going to be uh, given for AIA credit. If you are interested in that, uh, contact Ken, right, probably, um, and he, he can set you up with that. Course description is what it came up as uh, in, your, in the meeting invite, uh, as are the lear learning objectives. and. Um, First, want to dive into what I'm covering and what I'm not. So just to get uh, clear about what, what it is that I do, what it is I'm focusing on here. I'm working in new media uh, as opposed to traditional media, um, social media marketing, uh, of course, being a big part of that, and content marketing. And you might have heard that term thrown around before. And if you haven't, um, you probably know what it is. It's just uh, the way the internet works now, um, now that we have uh, many more robots than humans on the internet, we no longer have it set up so that uh, you can game the system. Uh, the, the, the search engines and such are set up so that actually good content is what floats to the top. And so now because of that content marketing, making good content is the rule of the land when it comes to being online. Um, so, and then uh, I'm also focusing on new leads, so getting attention of new people um, rather than uh, nurturing relationships beyond that new, uh, new attention grab uh, moment. So not focusing on traditional media, not focusing on things like print ads, conference sponsorships, things like that that are kind of more um, that you is more of a guided process and nothing beyond uh, the leads, so meaning uh, as you see, the top of the funnel, um, that the, the, the further relationship of prospects, customers, and repeat customers is sort of a different conversation. So that's, that's my focus here. My other assumptions going into this is that uh, you probably don't have a big marketing team if you're here in this room, virtual room right now. Uh, you, if you are at a big firm, you probably, uh, they probably don't talk about Passive House very much, and, and that's probably up to you. So I'm counting that too as saying, the marketing budget uh, set aside for Passive House is probably small. Time and money is a constraint. Uh, also, you're already doing something right. I'm gonna be covering a lot of different options here, a lot of different paths that you can take. I'm sure you're doing some of them. I'm sure you're doing some of them very well. And so this is sort of um, a opportunity to reflect on what you are doing and different options that maybe can come into it. Um, like everyone here, you want to grow the amount of po Passive House projects you're doing. Even if that's the only thing you're doing, you want to do more of them. Um, and you also won't use that, everything here. It's sort of it, like the, you're already doing something right. Uh, some of these things aren't going to be for you. So um, what I'm going to try to do is, is let out like a web of suggestions that you can kind of find to choose your own adventure through. So being as the, uh, we're talking about Passive House, uh, I set this up as an analogy. Uh, you're going to be designing your marketing like you design your buildings. So we're going to use the analogy of the different aspects of Passive House in order to talk about um, what it is that you want to design uh, for your the interface, the way that people interface with you online. Um, and so great image there from Richard Petranti. Pret architect there. Um, I, I Very clear. I like that one from a marketing perspective. I'll talk a little bit more about that. So what do I mean by using this analogy? I mean, first, we're going to identify your clients as you would with a, with a building. You're not going to build without having the clients there. Um, we're going to select the materials that you're going to use. We're going to talk about the performance metrics that you need to follow. We're going to think about just as you think about a passive house as a holistic system, you're gonna think about your marketing as a holistic system. Transparent elements, uh, windows being the analogy there, are incredibly important. 
continuity is as well, um, and having a, a, a continuity of the air barrier as with uh, aspects of your marketing and fresh air, of course, vital. Um, so diving into those analogies, first we're gonna talk about identifying your clients. So your clients, your audience, uh, AKA, um, what do you wanna know? You wanna know who they are, what they're searching for, how they're gonna find you, how once they've found you in the bucket of whatever they're finding you in, how do you get their attention of all the different options? And uh, where do they hang out online? Um, where, where do you find the most of your audience? So if those are some of the questions you wanna answer and, and thinking about audiences is, is very important as a first step. Um, this is where we kind of get into the, the, the variety of options here. And you've, again, you've probably already defined some of this, but some of these are going to be, I would suggest doing multiple of these to sort of uh, help refine or maybe expand uh, the audience that you're already talking to. So uh, one, uh, one method of research you could do is, is considering your best clients. So look back and try to take like sort of a detective lens to this. Um, first off, how do you define best? Could be the biggest invoice out there. It could be the one that you uh, enjoy working with the most. It could be um, a situation um, uh, the, the type of building that you want to be working on more. So uh, really go back through that history of those conversations, take an objective opinion on it, and uh, really try to figure out, okay, how did we connect? What was the trajectory of that? How, what conversations did we have to, to make that work well? Um, so that's one exercise you could be doing. Um, another one sort of related is interview. Um, so it could be reaching out to one of those best clients, it could be reaching out to somebody you've never worked with, but you would like to work with. Um, that's, uh, I've, I've done interviews with uh, customers of ours in the past, and it's been very successful. Uh, now's a great time. Everyone's kind of sitting around at their computer for a lot of the day. Um, you can definitely set up some interviews with people and uh, ask open-ended questions. Find out what they're interested in, why they're interested in it, where, what websites they're going, who do they read, um, things like that. It's a great way, and you'd be surprised. Uh, you might think it feels, uh, you know, burdensome or something like that to, to ask people for interviews, um, but I find it's quite the opposite. Most people that I uh, connect with feel great about getting to um, open up and tell you all about what they're thinking. And who knows, that might actually uh, lead to you working together in some context, but at least uh, you walk away with, with uh, new insights, uh, different perspective and uh, positive feelings about it. So uh, another one is to create profiles. Um, so this one is more, uh, those, those two were based in reality, this one's more imaginary. So you're imagining, um, profiles of people that you work with or would like to work with. Um, and I really suggest fleshing those out, like base them on somebody, uh, give them a name, give them a location, um, really flush it out and imagine yourself in the, their shoes, not imagining uh, what you know about building, but imagining what they know as people, as profiles um, about uh, and and just like get online and start searching in their shoes, in their head, uh, and start imagining what uh, what it is they find and how they find it. And um, you know, don't don't use any of your your typical websites that you go to. Search from scratch um, and and really kind of uh, pay attention to um, to to what it is you find if you're searching from scratch rather than knowing what you know. Another uh, way is identifying keywords. So this would be using Google's keyword. Um, here, wait, I have this, got to get this out of the way. There we go. Using Google's keyword planner um, or Google trends, uh, social media hashtags. That's another good way to go through is to go through 
um, just follow the, the rabbit hole of hashtags through social media and find collection of keywords and search terms that help you find your audience. So you're kind of backtracking because the audience is finding things through those keywords and hashtags and you're finding the audience by backtracking through that. So th that, those are two things and Google Keyword Planner, uh, that one is one that you're going to find by through the Google Ads account. If you use any Google profiles whatsoever, you can start up a Google Ads account without having an ad. So you can use the Keyword Planner without um, spending any money. Um, another way is uh, finding influencers. Um, by this, I mean, uh, I know that word gets thrown around on social media a lot. So uh, literally just people who are influencing the conversation. Um, who, what platforms are they using? How do they communicate? What are the most popular uh, posts or videos or, or blog posts that, that they have? Um, and is this where people hang out? Do they hang out uh, on that site or, or, or on those social media profiles? So after you've done some of these research methods, you want to sit down and think, maybe do two or three of them, I, I would really suggest, because you're not going to find everything in every method. Um, and, and you go through and, and just ask, how many audiences do you have? Uh, what's the span of them? What, and how specific do they get? The more specific, the better. The more you specify, the better off you're going to be. Because especially in online advertising, online marketing, um, the, the level of granularity you can get down to is uh, practically criminal, <laughs> in my opinion. And so um, the more specific you get, uh, the better off you're going to be. Um, so which platforms came up the most? Where were people hanging out? What were the biggest topics discussed? What weren't they talking about that you think they should be talking about that you can fill that gap? Um, and also who should you be collaborating with if you are starting from zero, if you're starting from scratch with a new profile or a new site or something like that, um, who would it make sense to sort of ride the coattails of or engaged with in some way, uh, collaborate with um, to get off the ground. So next we're gonna be talking about material selection. Um, very important for buildings, very important for your passive house. And uh, in this analogy, we're talking about um, material, we're talking about content. Uh, so that's what I mean by the material. So I'm gonna divide this up in a way that, uh, hopefully is kind of a new perspective on it. I want you to first just think about what it is you like to do uh, from this list. Basically, all the content you see online is one of these things. Um, and any of these things you can be using to promote Passive House Online. And so um, again, if you're starting from scratch, maybe if, you, if you're not even, um, pick one of those things, and I want you to separate it from the platform. So the platform is is a different story. That's the way that you're distributing it. Um, it's it's not the way that you um, what you're making. And so uh, let's say in this example that you have a great camera, you like photography, and you think to yourself, okay, well I like photography, so obviously Instagram is going to be the way that I connect. But I also want you to that could be true, that could be true. But I want you to think about the audience perspective. So the, the, the research that you did in thinking about audience and, and taking a, an objective look at that, is that where they're actually collecting? You don't have to use the photography skills if that's the thing that you wanna to connect to, to tell your story. You don't have to, to use it on a certain platform. Um, you can think about it as being in multiple platforms or multiple different options. Maybe a website is the best platform for it. Maybe you want to collect the photography and put it in a webinar and because that's going to be the best way to connect. Or maybe it's going to be all of the above. Um, you've got to kind of divorce those two things from each other so that you can bring them back together again as, as, as the, the material and the platform. And so, um, and that's going to be in part, as I said, defined by uh, the audience and where the audience, where you're going to find your audience. So there's lots of different options in this, on the 
what you could be creating with these these basic elements of content. Um, and some of these you know very well. Hopefully you can see this. This is a great uh, infographic from Neil Patel, which is uh, who's a it's a website and a person um, that focuses on marketing, not on passive house marketing, just marketing in general online, and uh, does does great has great information. And this is basically every way that you could form your content. So some of these you'll find are very familiar uh, from what you know of in in the building world and passive house world. Certainly webinars, videos, eBooks, um, things like that. And uh, there's lots of different options of what you could be using that maybe you don't see as often. So there's, think about it as, as, as uh, plenty of different, uh, uh, plenty of different options for, for how you could form that content. I know, for instance, tool reviews, their tool reviews are incredibly popular online. I don't necessarily see somebody who's like focused on that in the passive house world. So that could be a gap. That could be a, an opening. Uh, depending on it, what you want to talk about and what you, who you want to connect with. Um, other things like, uh, um, uh, let's see, mind maps or surveys or, um, you know, case studies, things like that, that I could really see connecting with passive house audience in different ways and that, that aren't, uh, there's kind of not a super well-established people out there uh, making those things. So um, next is performance metrics. So you've got, your, you've got your material, you've got your content, you've got your audience. Now you wanna know, you wanna define out, okay, what, um, what is success and failure? Um, and so you wanna know if uh, you're developing these performance metrics just as you would with, with Passive House, you know, uh, uh, you know um, doing blower or test or you know, whatever it is that, that you, uh, you know, your, your, your uh, energy use per square foot per year. But um, so in that same vein, you want to choose a few metrics, not, you're not choosing dozens because you could choose dozens. You want to keep it simple. So you want to choose one to five metrics that can be easily monitored. You don't want to have to dig. Um, so you, you're developing uh, the audience, you've got the material. Um, how do you know whether or not it's working. You wanna have a clear goal and again, as specific as possible because this is your bullseye. This is how you know um, success or failure or something other than a dollar sign that is telling you um, whether or not the marketing activities are really working. So I wanna give some examples of that again and, and run through these uh, different things you could, could choose. Maybe it's a combination of all of the above, but at least I'm sort of diving into uh, specifics of examples that, that could help. So one is completing a form. This is a very common one online is a simple contact form um, that on your website that gathers the basic information, contact information. It could be used uh, to request a quote, request information, schedule a meeting, something like that. Um, and you, and this is another good example. You want this to be as specific as possible because you don't, people, Think about it again from the shoes of the person coming on. You've created this profile. They're looking at the site. If it just says, contact us, maybe they will. It's a little bit boring. But if you thought ahead of time and said, okay, I know I want, it, I want to attract X audience. They're, they're looking for this. They're searching for this. I know the keywords that they're searching for. You want to connect those things so that your contact form specifically speaks to them. And the more it speaks to them, the more likely they are to click that, enter their information, and get a hold of you. So that would be that could be one uh, performance metric uh, that, that you keep is, is the number of people who have completed those forms. And of course, you want to save that information and reach out to them. Another very common one is clicks. So uh, in this example, let's say you've focused on email marketing. You've decided that that's the best platform for you. Um, so the, the, the judging the success of that could be based on the number of opens or clicks after 24 hours. So in this example, again, I'm narrowing it down. You could just look at clicks, and it's just not going to give you a ton of information if you just look at clicks. You're going to know if something's popular or not. You want to refine that as with all of these, as much as possible. And so uh, in this example, I'm saying 
okay, I've, I've taken a step back, I've looked at this and I've decided, um, you know, it's really those people in the first 24 hours after I send this email out that are ever go on to be good customers. And so I want to improve, I want to focus on changing my analytics so that when I'm sending out these, these emails, the, the number that pops up in that first 24 hours is really the only one I'm paying attention to. If it, if it, you know, bursts out of the seams three weeks down the line or something like that, I'm not interested. It's only that first 24 hours and I want to increase and do things to change um, so that first 24 hour click rate goes way up. Um, and that's going to be your focus. So let's take a slightly different look uh, at those first two, the completing form and clicks that, that I just talked about. Let's say, let's say you've gotten really good at it and you found I've got hundreds of people completing this form. It's not really a good uh, indicator anymore. So you change. And so um, at that point, it's not who's completing the form, it's how many people actually reply once you reach out. So you only count your goal, your only metric, your metric is only counted after they fill out the form, you reach out to them and they get back and they confirm yes, I do want to meet. And you found that, yes, those are the people that I actually am most interested in, in upping my count. Um, so you, you focus your energy on that. You focus your energy on, the, on those, the folks that have replied at that point. So just kind of a different variation on that same concept. It doesn't have to be something as simple as when they complete the form. It could be when they have a response to you. Um, Another one is downloads. Uh, having, some, having an action that takes at least a little bit of commitment. Uh, and by commitment, I mean for downloads, it's you know, you're, you're giving your information, you're taking up a little bit of room on your computer, that's enough of a commitment for me to know that like, okay, um, that is something worth counting. That is something that, um, um, that they actually thought about it and they actually took the time to do it. Downloads is a little more, little more commitment than just clicking on a, on a regular page. Um, another way to look at it is time spent. So analytic, anything that does analytics probably uh, tracks time spent. And so that's, that's another interesting one. So let's say you're doing YouTube videos, you've decided that's your platform um, and you're, you're putting presentations on YouTube. And that's, that's one of the things that you've decided to do is outreach. Um, you should know that uh, YouTube, you go in the analytics for YouTube, you can see exactly how much of your audience was paying attention for how long. So that's a great metric. So if you want finishes on your videos, you want people to get to the end of your video and you pull it up and you realize that 60% of your audience dropped off at the five minute mark when you started talking about X, Y, and Z, Oh, okay. That's the problem. I've, I, X, Y, and Z, I got to change that perspective on, on how I was talking about that. Or maybe they don't want to hear about that. Maybe I got to look at the, uh, look at the keywords on that again and, and figure out, is that worth talking about? Apparently my audience doesn't like that. So, or it could just be, maybe there was a glitch. Maybe something happened that you should, enough people are just like, ah, I'm not watching this that's great information for you. And the more that you can integrate that into what you're creating, the better off you are. So those are all examples um, of performance metrics that you can consider. Again, like I was saying, um, there are plenty of options out there that aren't on this list. Um, it's really, I'm really kind of giving examples of things that you should consider when you're considering your, that combination of audience uh, material and um, what you wanna present to the world. So next is transparent elements. Um, and let's see. So by that, in this analogy, uh, this Windows analogy, you want to show yourself in your process. So uh, content-driven marketing uh, is, is often, people often use the words uh, uh, authentic. Uh, they, they want something, they want to see that you're real. And again, this is sort of, connected to that whole, you know, there are more robots online than there are real people. Um, you got to show the real things that you're doing. And, and the things that you're doing are probably more interesting than you may, may think. You may think, well, I just, I, I do my thing and, and who could, you know, who could be bothered to uh, pay attention to that? 
But um, there's a lot of things that you can take. You don't have to show everything, but there's a lot that you can take from your existing work, especially if, I think in our world, presentations you've developed, uh, whether those be for conferences or um, other means of communication, you've probably poured a lot into presentations in the, in the past. Events that you have attended, events like this one, events like um, conferences, NAPHN, there's a lot that can be grabbed from those and used that you're already doing um, and that you can just sort of show in a different light. So um, it could also, these, these are just examples, it could be something else completely unique to you. And uh, I have some fun examples of that. Here's a great one. I don't know if you've seen this, but YouTube, uh, the Hy Hydraulic Press channel. Uh, it's a great example, I think, of an offshoot um, uh, success story in that it is uh, this company, I don't even know what they did before, but they have a big old hydraulic press and who doesn't want to see what happens when they uh, try to crush this flask full of water? Um, <laughs> it's going to be fascinating, right? So this company just happened to have a hydraulic press in the back, figured out that people really wanted to see them crush stuff with it. And look at this, they've got 23 million views on this single, this single video. And I guarantee you now that whatever they were doing before, A, they're making more money on this than they were doing before. But I know that's not our goal. Our goal is to promote Passive House. B, they don't have to worry about getting, uh, getting jobs. They've got, they've got it. Um, I know I'm, seeing, I'm, I'm looking, I'm looking on there now. Um, oh, I just, uh, just noticed the, the past, uh, questions and things like that. Um, let me just check in. Is there a metric tie sales? Sorry. Can a metric tie sales or close deals to activity? I'm not quite sure about your question, Ken. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, and I want to uh, click subscribe on that. That makes sense. We can do questions at the end, too. Okay. And our friend Andrew here, uh, to, to, to bring it back to the Passive House world, a good example um, is uh, this video, which if you search Passive House on YouTube or in Google, whatever, um, this will often pop up as one of the top options, 1.5 million views. And Andrew, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but when I was out there, I, I think uh, you said that you get all of your, all of your clients from people watching these videos, A, and B, that your current project, AB Passive House, who is your neighbor, uh, found you through this video, not through knowing you. <laughs> That's true. YouTube, YouTube's ridiculously useful as a channel. Um, and in this case, um, it was Kirsten who, um, does anybody know Kirsten? Do you, is she familiar to anybody? So she pretty much for 11 years now, she's been making videos on interesting buildings around the world. Yes, I, I've been watching the videos for a while. She's awesome. She's totally awesome. And so she, she called me up one day. Um, and this is a pretty average. She has over 100 videos with over a million views each. Right. So, so this is this is a great example of several things that I've talked about. You're connecting with somebody who's established. You, you could have put out this exact same video on your channel that you was brand new and had zero subscribers and you would have 50 views 100? right now. Yeah. And by Kirsten coming out and doing it, you got 1.5 million. And so it's a great example of connecting with somebody who's established on platform, picking a good platform for relaying the message and showing your work. So this is your existing work. You weren't doing this to create a video. You're doing this because this was, this was the home that you're building. So show, like take, knowing that showing your work and showing it on in many different ways as you can is, is, is an important lesson. I so, think for me at least it shows like how, how important it is to work with collaboratives and not just take everything on yourself, but definitely work with people who know the business and who can tell your help you with the storytelling right. component. Absolutely, absolutely. 
Um, so another example is something that I had earlier, the, the image from uh, Richard Pedranti Architect. So I used this one because I was making a presentation and I Googled Passive House and clicked on the images and this was one of the top five recommended. And was this image put out there in order to market? Probably not maybe like it was probably put out to educate in some way but it was well done and so whatever the, the initial use of it was um, is kind of superseded once enough people have taken the image combined it put it on their site like once enough people have kind of qualified it as good content it floats to the top and I guarantee you even if you if they don't know they're getting work from this they probably are because if somebody's searching for it, it comes up, it ranks so high that people are going to be like, well, who created that image? Oh, oh Richard Pedranti architect. I think I'll go check them out. You know, and so just by the nature of creating good content, even if it has unintended consequences, perhaps, because this isn't an advertisement per se, but it's, it's just a well done image and enough people agreed. Um, so those are those are all sort of my examples of the of the, the you know the something else unique um, and and using your existing work. Um, so next, I want to move on to a different part of transparency, let's say, um, and and thinking about your transparency, and that's passive house terminology. And unfortunately, um, it's often uses a wall uh, in, in our industry. And I think when we're talking to people, not just passive house terminology, but um, building science jargon in, in general, uh, if you're using it with the wrong audience, if you've determined your audience and, and it's the wrong audience to be using it with, it, it will be a barrier between you and them. And it's a, it's, it can be a dead end. And so the question is really how familiar is your audience with the terminology that you're using, in this case, passive house terminology. And um, here, I gotta move this again because I can't see, there we go. So um, I'm classifying this as three general buckets, very uh, familiar with passive house terminology. So that would be this crowd, for instance, somewhat which is going to be a wider section of people out there and not at all, which is going to be most people on the planet at this point. So not at all is like 98% of all people uh, somewhat um, is going to be a wide range, but probably like 1.9% and very is us over here at the 0.1% who know all of the passive house terminology and like to throw it around. And so first we're gonna talk about that biggest section, the not at all, because it is most people at this point. And the example that I like to give is the building science translator. So this was a project out of the DOE under Sam Rashkin a few years back. Um, and the goal was turning insider uh, building science jargon into language that is inclusive, effective, and consistent. And so the, the, the goal, which a lot of time, energy, and money was put behind uh, very good research that went into this. I went to a few different presentations that they did around this as they were developing it. And I would love to see it included more in, in, in our world is, um, so first off, you're starting here with the jargon end of things. So this is how we talk. And if you look at this list of red words here, you can easily put this in a sentence, I'm sure, like a totally easy sentence uh, that, that, that we pretty much all understand. So I would, you know, in order to hit passive house, we have to do the blow door test. But before that, we got to connect the air source heat pump penetrations and ERV to the continuous vapor open WRB and seal up our triple pane windows before we start the test. You know, like uh, this, this, that lost the vast majority of humanity right there, but um, you probably got it. <laughs> it's probably a real sentence that you've said uh, or something close to it. So what this building science translator, they've taken words and they've made, they've translated them for average human beings. And um, air source heat pump becomes combustion free space heating. Again, like a lot of these things, you're not going to use all of these terminologies, but this is something to consider, a way of reframing how you're speaking to people and what words you're using based on what you think their knowledge and their knowledge set is. So um, 
air source heat, heat pump doesn't say a lot to the average person. So a lot of people know what a heat pump is, um, but another way to frame it, even if they know what a heat pump is, it actually sells it more if you say it's a combustion-free space heating. So that's, that's what we're putting in your building. We're, we're using combustion-free space heating, meaning I get you're heating the space, and I get that it's combustion free. And you know what? You can't really, it's hard to argue with, you know, like, do you want to put combustion in the building? You know, so it's already framed there for you um, just in the language that you're using. ERV, fresh air system. Who doesn't like fresh air? ERV, you might get in an argument about whether or not, uh, whether or not you need it. Um, and or you know hrv erv like what's the difference all those things doesn't matter you've got that figured out you're the professional you want to sell them a fresh air system so that's another way of framing it um continuous vapor open wrb we talk about it a lot at 475 we're talking about solitex continuous vapor open wrb because we're talking to professionals if we're talking to the general public it'd be a dry by design wall and again you get you don't want a wet wall you're going to argue with that yeah we're using this membrane because it's dry by design we're making it dry by design um triple pane windows become enhanced comfort windows some people are, are familiar with how many panes are in a window some people aren't maybe they don't know why you need three panes so instead you're you're calling it enhanced comfort window i love this one blower door test i've heard plenty of people say what, sorry, what are you doing to my door? How are you testing the door? It's not clear to people. Advanced draft detection tells them what they're getting. They're getting their, their drafts removed. They are ensuring that we're removing drafts. Um, and then finally, passive house itself, it does uh, have some issues uh, using the terminology passive house. You really have to think about in selling passive house, you might not use the term passive house which I know, right? Um, and so another flip on that using this building science translator is comfort optimized home. You know, like s s setting it up in such a way to say, we build the best buildings on the planet. That's why you come to us. It, do they have to know it's, it's passive house? They don't really. Um, it depends on how much you want to educate about any of these things. If you want to educate them about what an ERV is, if that's part of your goal, great, say ERV, and then have what you need to back up to educate them. Otherwise, say fresh air system. If you don't want to do the work of, of, of uh, the additional work of educating about what that is, um, don't use the jargon if you don't want to educate. So that is the not at all section. Moving on to the somewhat section, um, I have a, I had to like stand up and applaud when I watched the other day, Greg Huffart from uh, Tree Construction um, up in British Columbia, rural British Columbia, did the, uh, at the NAPHN, did density is good and infill is best, and was talking about how the company switched the way that they talked about, it was, it was such a good example, uh, that they were initially trying to sell people on the concept of passive house and just really struggling to communicate that and people would be like well you know they'd say do you want to do a passive house we would really like it and they would basically be met with why why would you do that and then in 2017 they made a decision as a firm that they would no longer do anything other than passive and the conversation they started having with their clients changed not to whether or not to build passive but how they're going to achieve our goals so basically they said they, they took a hard stance and said this is what we do if you don't like it uh, we have people you, we can recommend but this is what we do and so that's kind of another method of communication another way of framing in which you can talk about it you can use some of the terms but um, you're just saying, this is the way we build, take it or leave it. And I think realistically, we should all kind of be somewhere in between where um, maybe, maybe you're taking a hard stance on some elements of these. You say, we just build this way and, and or you're also using more open language, more um, inclusive language to describe these things. Ultimately, ultimately, though, with the knowledge that we are doing passive house 
certified building. So I, I think that the real answer is somewhere in between. It's it's for you to decide. But I think as a community, we could be better about code switching, about knowing when we're talking to passive house people and when we are not. Because um, if we're talking about the very, which is us, very familiar with passive house terminology, um, you don't need to change a thing. Uh, you don't have to change anything about, about any of those terms. But I think that we need to get better about um, sizing things up, knowing our audience, and changing the terminology that we use to connect with them, because that's what it is. If you're not using the language to connect with them, you're using it to divide from them. So there's that section. Uh, quick drink. Now we're going to talk about how this is a holistic system. Um, so we've talked about your existing work, presentations you developed, events. This is where you're getting a lot of your content. Uh, now we're going to look at how the different, different platforms and how those are framed. So let's say you've got a website. You've got here in the blue, uh, the, uh, the blue diamond is, is an action. That's your, your metric. You're using that contact form as a metric. So what do I often see? Uh, you've, you've got your content over here. You've got um, a, a lot of different companies that maybe I, I, I first am looking up or I first hear about. I'll, I'll check out what they have online and I'll, I'll find something like this. I'll find the website contact form. Um, and they maybe ha they have an Instagram. Their website's pointing to the Instagram. And on the Instagram, I find they've got, you know, three posts. And they were put up there three years ago. And way over here, if you do further down the search, you find, oh yeah, that company also has an event, right? And that's where they put the website. Uh, that's where they put their, their events through. And it's not connected. None of this is connected. So you've got a website um, that maybe wasn't updated super long ago. You've got an Instagram that is a dead end uh, because if they're not active, if they're not posting things, it's a dead end. And probably a lot of people just get lost out of here. So they, they check that out, they click, they're gone. Um, and that's, that's a good way to like sort of end the conversation. And so that's what you don't want to do. What you do want to do is connect them all. Whatever you have, connect them all. They should all be pointing to everything else. So, um, and ideally, you want to funnel them all up to your point of entry, that, that metric that you're using. In this case, let's say a contact form. So I'm going to kind of go through an example of how you might do this. So let's say this would be a pretty common collection of different platforms that you would have. Um, and you've decided you've got some, some great uh, ideas from presentations you've developed in the past that you think would be a great method of communication, like content for your communication. And so you pick out a few slides and you're like, hey, these are going to be great things to share on different platforms. So this is, this is a common one I see when, when I talk to people who I'm encouraging to uh, promote ideas out there. Like people often say like, well, I don't really have anything. You've already got something. Just go figure out which ones are the most easily communicated out of context out of the slides. And you're gonna basically um, just put those right on Instagram, let's say. So you've got these five slides that make great posts. Uh, you schedule them out across time. And so they're not all happening on one day. They're, they're happening over the course of several days. And then your website, of course, connects to the Instagram. Instagram, at the end of each one of those posts, points back to the website and says, visit the website. And let's also say that you're planning on doing that presentation again as a webinar. Well, Instagram points to Eventbrite. Eventbrite points back. Uh, and suddenly, these, these posts that you're done that are really just trying to uh, you know, promote your platform a little bit are also promoting your uh, webinar that's coming up. So you've done that. You've got your your Eventbrite um, site set up. You're connecting that to the website, and the website has an events page. You're connecting that to LinkedIn. You're you're pushing that out to people that you you know and you are um, you know part of a. a a high performance building group on LinkedIn. So great, they're all starting to get connected. Your presentation happens. At that point, you've recorded your presentation and you've put it on, on YouTube, like we're gonna do for this one. Um, that YouTube, uh, that, that presentation is now um, put 
in video form right back on LinkedIn again. Um, the, it's also put on your website. It's in all of these are connecting to one another and pushing toward your metric right up there. And so I know this, is, this can get a little bit confusing, but I try to sort of break it down in a way that it seems clear. It's like you're, you're taking one idea, you one set of ideas, and you're just using it again and again and again to point to all these different things that you want to connect to people through. Um, so I know that can, that can get to be a bit much. And again, if, if I'm thinking about from my assumptions working in a small group here, you may want to pare it down. And I want to throw out there that this could be an option for what your holistic system looks like. You don't need a website anymore. If you've decided that that's not going to be the best way to connect, what you want is things that are updated often. And uh, if they're not updated, maybe you don't need them. Like you should consider that because for a platform like this, what do you have access to now in 30 seconds after creating a profile, you have video, you have photos, you have live streaming abilities, you, have, you can track your engagement, you have direct messages, you have analytics, you have paid ads. This is an entire platform in and of itself. If you find that that's a good platform for you and your audience, you don't have to have the other things. If they're not updated, don't use them. Um, let's say another example. Maybe you don't want to be using uh, Facebook's, uh, you know, giving money to Facebook, uh, or or maybe that's not the right audience for you. Um, then you could just have a website and a blog and a contact form and not have any social media. You don't have to have social media. If if you find that the best way to connect is creating really good content on your site that pops up higher and higher in search all the time, and directing that traffic directly to a contact form. That could be all you need. And that's where you spend all of your time. Um, but that's going to be informed by all the other things that we've talked about, what your metrics are, what, who, who your audience is, where they already hang out, how you can connect them. So don't over, like, just like our buildings, you're not going to over-engineer this system. You want something that works in harmony. You want something that connects to everything else. But above all, never forget continuity. The air barrier needs to be continuous. So does your, your, your profiles and the way that you connect with people. So make a plan for something that you can do consistently. No one follows someone who makes five posts and then stops. No one. Doesn't matter how good, the, nobody, nobody in this world is making super viral content that you only need to put out a few things. No one. You got to keep putting things out. And so that's why in the, in the choosing your materials, you're, you're choosing something that you, um, that you want to do over and over again. And you don't have to spend so much time just burdening yourself with this. If you're using social media, use social media schedulers. Schedule them out. There's multiple different platforms uh, that exist now that schedule all of your social media. Uh, and you can span it out over the course of six months. You could sit down, you could spend a whole, you know, like if you could dedicate like a whole day, you could schedule out an impressive amount of time um, and then just be responding as people get back to you. Um, and so you don't have to be, you know, stacking yourself with, with this, this thing that you have to do every day. Make things that can be used over and over again. Once you create something, use it again. If you're growing on one of these platforms, if you're growing your audience, they haven't seen what you did six, six months ago. Uh, and certainly not a year ago because you've got a lot more people now. And so when you make something, make it to be used over and over again. And that creates consistency as well. Build off what you already have, like I've been talking about, um, the things that you've already done, do them well in a way that you can share um, and do things you like. If you like photography, if you like you know, creating videos, focus on those things. Um, and just, you know, feel free to drop the things that you don't maintain. Drop them or make them, you know, if it, like I, in my example, the profile with five posts that you, you updated a year ago, um, just make it private. You know, you might use it to connect with other people in some way, but at least it won't be a dead end. At least somebody won't find it from your site, go there and be like, oh, this, they might not be a business anymore. I don't know. You know, like you don't want that to happen. So um, focus on, 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 
on growing and being good at the things that you have. And then the last one, fresh air. Um, so once you have this whole system, once you are doing it regularly, you're gonna switch things up and do something new. So you've got this pattern, you've got this repetition going, you, you know what you post, you know when you post it, um, you know what you're putting out there. And then it's time to switch things up. So you do something a little different. You experiment, you try a different platform, you try a different way of communicating the same ideas. It doesn't have to be new ideas. It could be communicating them in, the, in, um, in a different way, which would reach a different audience. So you experiment. If it works, if your metrics say it works, you develop it, you integrate it into your regular activities, and you repeat. And that's, that's how you keep things fresh. So there you have it. That's the, the, the systems and how they connect. You're identifying the audience. You're selecting your materials. You're deciding what's success or failure. Creating a holistic system out of those parts. Um, being transparent about what you're doing and your process, but also being careful about how you communicate that. Um, and uh, doing it continuously and switching things up every once in a while. So um, as I said in the 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 um, summary of this, I was just kind of kind of go over some of the balance of of some of the different platforms to choose. Um, just this is purely based on my experience and and how I would rate them on a scale of one to ten. Each one of these options, just as a a means to kind of give examples. So, website and blog impact can be pretty high um, if you are managed to do a blog regularly you can really reach a lot of people. And the great thing is the impact is high because they're coming to you, they're coming to your site. Um, difficulty is not that hard, it's just a little time consuming. So you do have to have some time dedicated to it. And cost is practically nothing. If you, th there are such great uh, uh, platforms for building websites now. Um, if you're using Squarespace, if you're using Wix, whatever, if, as long as it's not an e-commerce site and there's not, a lot of complication to it if you're mostly blog based and you're talking about content there there are sites we could get you up and running 15 minutes with a beautiful site for pennies um and so that's out there now and so if, if you haven't redone your site in a while now is a good time to do it because of the different platforms that exist that can help you out um email campaigns impact is a lot less um, people are kind of tired of email at this point um, it's more of a way of just kind of keeping your existing audience. Um, difficulty is a little bit hard because again, you you kind of have to you, you got to switch it up a lot. You got to do things to maintain and, and keep that audience. Um, so it does take some creativity to think about different ways of framing things and keeping it fresh. Time a uh, little bit time consuming, not terrible. Cost is pretty low as well. Um, so it's not a bad option. It's just not the most uh, that you know your typical. Um, rate at which people actually click on the things that you put out there relatively low. And so you're not, you're not kind of expanding. Good way to, to communicate with people who already know you. Not a great way if you're talking about, as we are here, new leads. Webinars. You're on one now. Impact tends to be pretty high. Um, and that is, I say that because in my, in my experience in doing webinars, we've done a lot at 475. Um, people who join, engage, stick around to the end, they really hear it. They hear it. They um, stay interested. They ask questions. They connect. So the impact uh, with the audience is high. Difficulty is relatively high, mid-range, because you've got to develop good content. You've got to develop a good presentation. Presentations take time to do. Again, cost is low. We're all on here anyway. We've all got these systems going. Now's a great time to hop in the game. I know there's a lot of options out there, but there's also a lot of people, the audience has grown significantly for people who want to watch webinars. Social media, again, impact is more on the low side because um, you know not a lot of people engage in a significant way with social media. Um, it's a good way to kind of throw a wide net, but you're not gonna, necessarily, and it's a good way to show legitimacy. Again, like another thing that you have to worry about now is like, are you a real thing? People want to know that when they're first finding out about you. And one of the ways you do that is by showing that you engage, that you are talking to people. Um, 
Difficulty is pretty low. Time is pretty low. As I said, I would really recommend using a scheduler, using the, the content you already have. Cost could be a wide range because costs, I mean, costs nothing to get in on it. You don't have to spend a dime, but you could spend a huge budget on it and it would work. Um, it, it, it really works. You can get super targeted. As I said earlier, you want to define that audience because if you're working in five zip codes, you can spend hundreds on those specific zip codes and not on anything else. You can, um, you can ensure, you can take that profile, that customer profile and, and really refine it and just make 100% sure you know exactly who are going to see these ads. If they're on the platforms that you're advertising on, they are going to see it because you can get so specific and you can spend a lot of money on it. And, but you don't have to, you don't have to. And so that's why I, I make it a range. Ebooks, our ebook, The Smart Enclosure, um, ask Ken about it, uh, takes a lot of time, it's very difficult, but our impact has been incredibly high. If you haven't downloaded The Smart Enclosure, go do it uh, on 475.com uh, or .ca in Canada. Um, it's been one of the biggest ways to impact um, our audience, really has. Um, and it's, it's, it's come back a hundredfold and it will, once you've created it, the difficulty and that time in creating it, it runs on its own. Cost is very low. It just takes a lot of time and you want to create something that people really want and could really use. And so it's a win-win because people get something that is genuinely effective, can be genuinely used and you have a great connection with them. Video. I put video as the highest impact because I really believe that it is. It's it the face-to-face -face connection, connecting like we are now and connecting in um, person to person um, is, is, is how you get through to people the most. And the great thing about video is that you can do that in, you can be connecting with someone face-to-face -face while you're sleeping. It's happening all of the time. It takes a little time and difficulty to get things up and running, but once you have a system, it's not that hard. Everybody's got video editors on there. You've got a video editor on this computer right now that you can use to create some pretty high quality videos. You just need to take some time to learn it if you haven't done it already. There's also video that isn't edited. There's, there's live stream video. There's, there's, if, if, you, if that's a good way to connect, all, you know, that's all good. Similar thing with cost. It does cost something to have a, you know, a good camera, good materials to, to create, but you've got a great camera on your phone already. A lot of people are just creating through that. You can edit on your phone now too. You can edit on your tablet. Um, once you've got the materials you need, you could, again, choose to promote them, which does work. It works quite well um, and you can get quite refined. Um, regardless of the platform, you can promote, you can do paid advertising. Uh, you don't have to. Again, it's more organic. It works better if you don't because people are coming to them because they found the keywords that, you, you, that you've established, that they, you know, you, you've set up a good system. So you don't have to. Um, so that concludes the AIA portion. And I just want to do a pitch real quick to say, hey, work with 475s. Um, so we have the, the website uh, for US and Canada. Uh, hundreds read our blog daily, 10,000K plus email subscribers, 7,000 plus Instagram subscribers. Project Spotlights uh, typically get within about 1,000 views in the first few weeks. Uh, this one with Phoenix House, who is very close to where the fires are right now, and I hope they're doing well, um, uh, that I did recently. Uh, we, we just peaked over 7,000 views with that one. We put it out in April. And so it's like, it's a good example of how people really want to see this stuff. They want to see how it comes together. Um, and they want to hear about the work that we're doing. And one thing that I get a lot with Project Spotlight videos that I make is a common conversation that I have with people that I'm filming is who's going to be interested in this? people are interested in this. You just have to, you have to say it. You got to toot your own horn. Um, you got to get out there and say it. And I want to, in working with 475, I just want to put out there that, you know, anybody who uses our materials, we, I mean, the, some people before have said, are you paying these people to say that? No, we're not. Um, we're not paying them. They're not paying us. Uh, 
if you use our materials, uh, we work with people because it's a it's a win win to present the, your project to the world and also to to show how our materials get used in the world. And so that's why we do that. So that is what I have to share. Um, and with that, I'm going to.